Welcome everybody to The Imperfect Conservationist. I am so thrilled to have my first guest on the show today, Ben Cross from all the way across the pond over in the UK. And before we jump into our chat today, Ben, I want to give all of you watching an update and just kind of let you know what's been evolving here with the show. Now, if you've been watching the series from the beginning, you know that I am starting to mix things up a little bit. This is based off of some fabulous feedback and comments from you, the audience, so please keep that coming. And I've been adding a few elements to the show, like the special edition episodes, digging into a little bit of the mindset, and really thinking like an imperfect conservationist. But there have also been some great requests to bring on some experts and take a little bit more of a deep dive into some specific conservation topics that I'm covering here on The Imperfect Conservationist. So real quick, just as a reminder to our regular viewers and for anyone who is out there new and just joining us, what we do here on The Imperfect Conservationist is take these big picture, large scale concepts of conservation and break them down into achievable, bite-sized, singular action items that we can easily bake into our own busy everyday lives. So with that, today I am so excited to have Ben Cross on the show. Ben is a flower farmer and even better, a sustainable flower farmer. It's safe to say that he's a longtime conservationist. Now Ben is owner operator of his family's business, Crosslands Flower Nursery in the UK. From everything I know about him so far, from reading into your background and some interviews you've done, growing flowers is absolutely his passion and more of a lifestyle for him. But not just growing flowers, doing it sustainably and, so important, working to raise awareness about conservation within the flower industry through his campaign, which I love, British Flowers Rock is what it's called, and also covering why sustainability is important when it comes to flowers, what impact it has, and what we can each be doing better as individuals to have a positive impact in this area. So today we are looking forward into spring, I'm so excited for spring, and talking about sustainable flowers. So Ben, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, and it's... Uh... It's always good to do these sort of interviews um, to other countries and other continents and yeah, just sort of uh, spreading the word because the, the problem we have here in the UK with imported flowers, it's the same within the US as well. So um, right. this is, it's still going to be really relevant to, to your listeners and viewers over there across the pond. So yeah, I'm looking forward to so having a chat with you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's one of those things, like so many, so many aspects of conservation. It's it's something we might encounter certain times a year, you know, thinking about flowers like so many things in conservation that we just don't necessarily think about where they come from or how that's important and that type of thing. So I'm really excited to dig into some of this and let's just uh, go ahead and dive in. And I would love for you to, to start by just giving us a little bit of your background of your work and what you do and how you got started. Oh, where do we begin? Right. <laughs> um, so, as I say, yeah, I'm, I'm Ben Cross from Crosslands Flower Nursery. So I'm a fourth generation. So our flower nursery, sort of the roots began back in 1936. So in the 1930s here in the UK, we had a thing called the Great Depression. So a lot of ship builders and miners were out of work. So the government set up over 20 areas around the UK where unemployed families would go and work and farm the land. And my great grandparents were originals. So one of the original families that signed up to this government initiative to have a piece of their own land and to start like a market garden. And back then, like we would think of it now, it was almost seen as like a Kickstarter crowdfunding sort of program. So the government wanted you to get on well with growing so you could set up your own business. And that's what my granddad did. Then my uh, mum, dad, uncles and aunties took over from my grandparents. And now I've taken over since since 2011. As you're right, I did marine biology from 2000 to 2011. And then it was my passion to sort of come back here and um, do my bit for the planet, you know, on, on the patch that we've still got. So all the flowers are grown in big, sustainably heated, biomass heated greenhouses. And we've got about four acres of those. So um, Yes, yeah, so that's a really, really brief history. I, I am curious, what what was your specialty in marine conservation? Sound like you did that for about a decade. Yeah, I always wanted to do something to help 
the planet as best I could. So yeah, I did marine biology for over 10 years and I did all sorts of things from aggregate, oil, gas, wind farms, wave energy, a seabird and a marine mammal surveys. I worked for oil spill response. So if ever there was an oil spill, we would go and help the locals clean it up and we would also go and train local people as well. But yeah, I mean, I lived around I lived around the world for over 10 years doing loads of cool random stuff. But at the end of the day, I was still working for, you know, BP, SO, Shell, Chevron or whatever they are. And my little surveys and all the effort I put in was a tiny little bit of the overall project. I just sort of had enough of working hard and not really getting that satisfaction from the conservation and the work I was doing. It's like you circled back around and, and tapped back into where you can really feel that inspiration by seeing your impact and the, the impact you're having on the world. And it, it sounds yeah. like that was a big player for you in coming back to the family business. Yeah, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to keep moving forwards with the British Flowers Rock thing. And while I was a marine biologist, a lot changed in the flower industry from 2000 to 2011. A lot of greenhouses um, and flower farms were deleted, eradicated for red brick housing estates and things like that because of the imports it was just say over 90 percent of the flowers in the uk are now imported and that figure was just rising and rising and um, i thought well let's try and do something about it because i didn't want my family's business you know um failing as well so stemming off of something uh, you know the the concept of what you were just talking about how stuff has changed with the flower industry i would love to hear a little bit more about what is going on with regard to conservation and sustainability in the flower industry? You know, like we were talking about at the very beginning that it's maybe not at the forefront to think about where these are coming from and the sustainability. So I would love to hear just from your background and expertise, what's happening with all of that and, and why is it important? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot. Obviously, over here in the UK, we've had the Jamie Olivers of this world and, and things like that. So, you know, people think a lot more about when they go food shopping, for example. They're trying to buy seasonal, local, you know, thinking about the plastic packaging involved, thinking about the chemicals involved, the storage involved, and generally the carbon footprint. And now that also affects when you buy a car or also now fashion. Sustainable fashion is a massive thing. You know, you go on apps like clubhouse for example and there's rooms dedicated to um, sustainable fashion sustainable cosmetics but flowers we're always left out man and we're always left out and and in in the uk it's a 2.2 billion pound industry so you've got food at the top then flowers then way below that is your, your video games and and fashion and all those other things and wow yeah 2.2 billion pounds worth in the UK and it's probably the same for the US. I mean, if you think about all the offices, hairdressers, cafes, restaurants that have flowers on a weekly thing, it's not just people buying flowers for their homes once a week. It's all these other businesses that buy flowers. And then you've got the event industry, hospitality, weddings, uh, birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Day, all this kind of stuff. So flowers are a big daily That's, part of uh, picking up a bunch is, of flowers at the gas station you know yeah. they're, they're everywhere so well, and that's fascinating to, to hear that like I didn't know that about those numbers to think that it is that massive of a market and now when you're you're outlining you know highlighting all the different places that you see flower that makes total sense but it's completely under the radar you're right you're like flowers are being forgotten and this is such an important topic that's mind-blowing yeah it's just pr trying to put the, the the listeners and viewers into context so I did a study with a university here in the UK and even flowers coming from Holland over, you know, from Holland to the UK, which is a short journey. Those flowers emitted 10 times more carbon than my bad boys, than my flowers, you know, and that's just coming from Holland. But most of our flowers and most of your flowers in the US, uh, they're coming from Ethiopia, Ecuador, Kenya, Colombia, South Africa. They're going a, a hell of a long way. And in the UK, when I had to deal with supermarkets, they wanted a five week forecast because it takes about five weeks for flowers to go around the world before they get into the stores here. And it's pretty much like Han Solo in Jabba's Palace, sort of cryogenically frozen, the amount of um, freezers, chemicals, transport, plastics, packaging. When you pick up a bunch of flowers, you've got that 
plastic sellotape and the plastic sachet with the man-made gunk inside the flower food and then all the wrapping as well. And there's probably more packaging within the flower industry than there is in the fashion or the food industry. You think of all those delicate heads and the plastic cable ties attaching the stems to a to a box or, or whatever. And It sounds like a very, and it makes perfect sense, a very complicated system in getting flowers to us, the consumers. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't and, have to be if you right, buy local. Well, well, right, and that, that in a nutshell is like the perfect synopsis of we want to know what that, like why we care what the problem is how, and what the impact is. And that is a huge impact that flowers have that I, I honestly have, have never really even thought about that. I, I want to know more about your campaign, British Flowers Rock. And I'm going to just put that up on the thing. I just think that's so awesome. I mean, it's my little, my little banner and your t-shirt. That's so cool. So tell me more about that. Like, what is, what is your mission what, and goals and, and what have you accomplished so far? Yeah, I mean, I did it off my own back through frustration. So I came back here to the flower nursery in 2011 and between 2011 and 2014 I tried to get help on this problem of all the imported flowers and I went to government I went to the National Farmers Union but yeah so I sort of basically was getting nowhere and getting really frustrated uh, that no one was number one talking about it but most importantly number two doing anything about it you know, some action and stuff. So in 2014, I just thought, well, I'll have a go at it myself then. So I literally just thought of British Flowers Rock, put it on a t-shirt and started talking about it, posting videos of me in the greenhouse. And I was surprised that even the older generation and people within horticulture and gardening clubs and flower clubs, they were like, oh, wow, we didn't know any of this. Like they didn't know over 90% was imported and they're the guys that are using the damn things, you know, wow. um, using the flowers. And so I, I wanted, I knew, I knew I was kind of onto something because like you've already said, like you, you didn't think of flowers as being a, a major problem in carbon footprint and, and things like that. So I knew I had something. So I just kept on trying to get to do talks and, and things like that about it. And no one wanted me as a speaker because I'm not famous I don't have a book out I don't have seeds or shovels to sell you know I just am a little flower grower in the UK in in West Sussex here in the country so it wasn't until mid or late I think it was summer 2014 that a local gardening club their speaker for that month had let them down they couldn't make it to come to the club so I must have been on like the bottom of a list somewhere <laughs> and I got a phone number and they said Ben can you come to the village hall in like half an hour and do you you, you know talk to them about your British Australia and, and, and things like that and your campaign and stuff and I I didn't obviously have anything then I didn't have videos presentations pictures it was just me standing up in a village hall for uh, about an hour in front of about 120 130 people and the next morning my phone was off the hook because wow. people that had been had seen that talk they were members of other clubs and so on and now people are booking me for 2022 to do gardening shows or you know oh, podcasts wonderful. like this and it's something that people can actually actually action you know they can phone UK growers up and go oh Ben can I have a delivery tomorrow yeah sure or can I come in and collect the flowers so when they come in and collect they're obviously collecting the raw product there's no packaging or chemicals or, or anything with that so yeah it was um the British Flowers Rock campaign was born out of frustration as the best are right like ne necessity is the mother of invention you said nobody else was doing it you were feeling you know mad that nobody was talking about this really important issue and then you're like wait I'm somebody I can talk about this I love that yeah. that's such a and cool I was, background I was feeling very vulnerable because in 2014 I and 2015 and even now I turn up at these big events and, and they go who are you and I'm like oh I'm Ben Cross I'm doing a talk today you know because they expect I mean I'm 40 years old but they expect an older person to be talking about you know the flowers and this sort of thing so I still get it even to this day like you know who are you what are you here for and then after I've done the talk they go oh, that's the that's the best talk that's the best speaker we've ever had here I think that when it comes from this place of of where your energy is and your excitement, I mean, that type of thing is contagious. 
you know? And so, and the topic is so relevant now and, and your mission to raise awareness on this issue. I think one of the things you said earlier, which, you know, I got to circle back around to it just to bring it up for the viewers again, is that you were saying it's like literally second as far as volume uh, of, of consumption of flour. Yeah, which, as, an, as an industry, it's a as big, an industry. It's a big yeah. old industry. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's huge of thinking about that and like, where can I actually make an impact? And then looking at that industry and just making, especially, you know, our viewers that own a business that have flowers in regularly, or if you're just a habitual flower buyer and looking at some of those things. So that kind of brings us into my next question that I want to ask you is, do you consider yourself an imperfect conservationist? Well, yeah, I'm not perfect. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm a bit eccentric and a bit out there. I think, I think it's just day to day living, isn't it? If we get a delivery to the flower nursery of, I don't know, fertilizer or, or boxes or just supplies, for example, and it comes wrapped in packaging, I'll keep all of that packaging and I'll use that inside my boxes. And even when I go and drop my flowers off at the wholesaler, I'll go around to the back of the wholesaler and I say, can I have all these boxes? And so I'm using boxes that have come from Colombia, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Israel, Egypt. I'm bringing back packaging that would otherwise um, have been in the bin. So I'm, I'm yeah. sort of reusing it again. So, yeah, it's definitely not perfect, but it's I'm doing the best I can. And I think that's all we can ask for people is to take some stuff in, be educated, learn, have a bit of fun and also just try and do the best you can. I'm lucky that I grew up in the country. I grew up within nature. So that's that's my priority. Whereas for someone growing up in London who has never seen a cow in a field, something in the UK, I do farmer time. And farmer time is where they pair a farmer grower with a junior school. Oh, cool. And I've actually been paired with a school in North London. So it's me on my phone walking around the greenhouse on Skype or Zoom or whatever for 20 minutes once every two weeks, just showing these kids the flowers, how we grow it and all that. And it's stuff like that that you take for, I take for granted. Sure. But those kids, they love it. Like you'd think kids, they want to play video games and stuff like that. Are they going to be interested in me stood in a greenhouse talking about flowers but they love it the, the, yeah. the teachers say it's the bet it's what they look forward to and they always talk about me and they even send me cards like at christmas or whatever that they've drawn pictures of me and oh, watching the so flowers cool. and stuff it's creating that connection for them which is so important and foundational like you said it's something that you know i grew up in the islands and i can take that connection for granted as well and it's so important to circle back around i mean that's where everything starts is that connection yeah and, and that's what i'm thinking doing with the British Flowers Rock campaign now, like you kind of, when you start these things, you kind of know where it's going to go, but then it sends you down all these weird avenues. And then those avenues are like, well, no, we need to, we need to teach the young kids about British flowers or sustainable flowers and, get, and urge them. It's just like Jamie Oliver has done with the food. Mm -hmm. That's what I've got to do with the flowers. And well, and that magic is really in the doing and taking action. Like you said, you were you yeah. were frustrated because nobody was talking about it. And nobody was. So you started. And then all of these these avenues and doors start opening to just like you manifest your your way for your mission, you know, and bring all of that to reality. So I want to hear on that note from you and your background and expertise. What and I'll pop this up on the up on the screen, too. What is you know, if you had to pick one thing. What could we do as imperfect conservationists, as the end consumer, to do better in this area with flowers? Yeah, what well, can it, I do? Can we do? Especially here in the UK, I don't know if this is the same in your guys in your shops and supermarkets, but the labelling and product placement of our flowers here in the UK is shambolic and as sketchy as ever so basically uh, we've got easter we've just had mother's day here in the uk and this weekend is easter and it will just say easter bouquet 10 quid 10 pounds okay. it won't say it won't say where they've come from where they were packaged what chemicals are on the packaging what chemicals are on the flowers it will give you no information it won't even tell you what flowers are in the bouquet and that's all that the uh, public have got to be educated and and go on so 
Uh, that, again, is what the British Flowers Rock campaign is all about, is urging governments to at least somehow legalise or get something in place where if it's not British flowers, say Kenya on, on the thing. It's got to say that. It's like here in the UK, we've got a sustainable fish logo on our fish and we've got barn eggs and free range eggs. And it's all very well laid out so people can, as this question says, make a difference if they can afford 4p more they can buy free range eggs instead of barn eggs so it's again the jamie olivers and the chefs of this world have really forced that issue i don't know if you've ever heard of them but we used to supply sainsbury's which is like a supermarket chain over here and um, we supplied them for a very very long time and a while back they used to have a picture of my uncle on the label crosslands nursery a little bit about the information and it was good trace we call it in the uk traceability people want to know where it's come from but also where it's come from has been sustainably grown or whatever farmed basically um so they, yeah they used to have a picture of my uncle on the label and then they got rid of that and they just put the Union Jack, the, the British flag on the label. And then three or four years ago, they got rid of that. And it said grown in Colombia slash UK. So the writing was literally on the wall, on the label, you know. And then ah. literally Valentine's Day 2020, I got a horrible phone call from Sainsbury saying, Ben, we don't want your flowers anymore because we can get them 4p cheaper a bunch from Colombia. Right. Uh, and then also, do you think that they took 4p off of the price for the customer? Because they were getting that's it. Just no, in they, they increased the price by 50p. Uh, wow. Wow, so that's about, incredible. If, if they can buy it in for cheaper and sell it for higher, they make a bigger margin and, sure. and make more money. So the one thing that people can do, which usually it would usually be, you know, make sure you look at labeling, make sure, you know, you're buying the right things. But how can you when when there's nothing to gauge on. So all I can say is I urge people to try and find out if they've got a local flower farm near them. I love the idea of just Googling flower farm near me, you know, how Google or whatever search engine will pop up with, with near me. And you can just put that in and try and find a local flower farm, which really, if you're thinking about it too, that's something if you're a business owner, you can promote that as well to, you can put a little label on the, a nice little card saying like, harvested locally like i'm doing my part as oh a business yeah owner and to support and when people have my flowers they're like oh i'm using all stromeria ben's flowers and they put it on their instagram and their twitter and their facebook and and that then helps that then helps the florist get more customers because the customers will go oh yeah i've heard ben that british flowers rock guy you know he's doing that campaign yeah i'm definitely yeah. up for buying ethical sustainable british flowers so i'm going to shop at that florist rather than the supermarket now right um, well and it sounds like there is probably going to be a, a at least equal or maybe even a savings to do it better yeah so it is a saving the, the, and plus uh, yeah, the flowers are going to last longer so even if you spend a couple of pounds more on a bouquet with my flowers and you're going to get another two weeks or a week out of it, you know? So right. what's that? And and they're better quality and, and more sustainable because they, they yeah, haven't gone, they haven't gone so far. They're sustainably harvested. They're all these things. So looking for a local grower, a local flower farm, wherever you are. And, is... and even if they're not local people like me, I, I mean, I, I courier my flowers all, all the way around the UK. And that's still going to be less of a carbon footprint than coming from oh, Colombia or wherever country. else yeah, yeah, they're yeah. coming from. Yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. that's excellent. That's that's something that's so easy to do. So I always three things I always look at whenever I'm thinking about implementing any change into my life. You know, just being busy when it's not COVID. I travel a lot for work. I'm a single mom. I've got you know we're all busy, and so I I look at my criteria is it has to meet at least two, hopefully three easy, money-saving, and impactful. So when looking at this, taking the simple step to look for a local flower farm or at least something within your geographic, country. your country, <laughs> it can make such a huge difference, it sounds like, just because of the volume of flowers that we as consumers you know, consume. Definitely easy to look for something local. Money-saving and affordable. I think basically when the public buy off of me they're skipping out about three or four middlemen this morning we got up at 6 a.m in the morning and started harvesting straight from the soil from the ground and those flowers they'll be with the 
um, general public at, at their doorstep tomorrow, wherever they are in the UK, fresh out the ground. You know, as a if it's a business owner or even just if you're buying yourself flowers or your partner flowers or whatever it is, what an awesome statement to make. One of the, the core foundations for the imperfect conservation is this how the changes that we make, these these small changes really can drive big change because they live on beyond us because they inspire others to make positive changes too. So when we're hungry for this information to do better, to to be more sustainable in our own lives. And we see something as simple as like, wow, they got their flowers, you know, from the little card or whatever it is, or they see one of your, your interviews and start thinking about it in a different way. That's such an incredible way to really have that become the great multiplier and ripple out because the good things that we do with conservation and the changes we make are contagious and they live on beyond us. And so I just, I love that. And that really everything you were talking about embodies all of that. I would love to share with people, Ben, how they can get in touch with you. If anyone wants to find out more, if you go on Facebook and type in Crosslands Flower Nursery, we're on there. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Ulstromeria Ben. So okay. that's the type of flower I grow. So I'm just called Ulstromeria Ben. And yeah. Wonderful. So and I'll go. put all those um, links below too in the description below this video so everybody can connect with you. Yeah. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on The Imperfect Conservationist. It was really a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope our paths cross again and again. And thank you, everybody out there watching for being here today. And I will see you next time.